All right, I guess that's probably going to be about everybody. Uh, some other people might show up a little bit later, but let me get started. Okay, so in the course on the right hand side, uh, you'll see in the upcoming list, there's this thing that says lionfish in the Caribbean, lionfish in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. And uh, so that's like an assignment for tomorrow, and that's going to be it for this week. And you'll have time both today and tomorrow to work on it. Um, in the materials for the course, the current get to it. So the waves, tides, and coasts, the current unit of study. I mean, what what we really care to study here is what happens uh, near to water. Um, or near to the shore, near to coasts, how waves affect the water, and there are relationships with currents too. And so I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, non-native and invasive species, and this issue with uh, lionfish and how they relate to currents and waves. And then there's an article, uh, lionfish in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. So this lionfish in the Atlantic and Caribbean article goes along with the uh, assignment, lionfish in the Atlantic and Caribbean. And I'll show you a little bit about this article in a little bit. But anyway, um, a little bit of news that's kind of exciting. Um, we've talked about Hawaii a couple different times in a couple different ways in this class. Because Hawaii itself is a unique and beautiful place. Uh, it's part of the United States. It's out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's, there's a lot of uh, volcanic activity that take, takes place there. There are coral reefs around the island. Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on with Hawaii. It has a lot of climatic zones on land, but one close relationship between uh, or about Hawaii is that although there's land and there's water, the land and water are a lot more intertwined than in other places. And last night, uh, the major volcano on uh, the big island of Hawaii uh, called Kilauea, it erupted again last evening. And it's kind of exciting because this last week there were a bunch of earthquake swarms near the um, near the volcanic vent itself. Let me take you to Hawaii to show you what we're talking about here. Okay, so the Hawaiian island chain is a number of islands. The oldest island up here, you know, uh, that's inhabited, you know, commonly is Kauai. The newest island and the biggest one which is what the state's named after, is the island of Hawaii. And in the south, well, there's two high peaks on the island of Hawaii, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. But here in the eastern part of the island, the southeastern part of the island, there's this Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And uh, there's an active uh, volcan volcano with an active crater. It's called the Kilauea um, Crater. And this is the peak of a volcanic cone. And here, if I go into 3D, you can even spin it around a little bit and see that um, hole. So it turns out that this is where eruptions had taken place in the past. And you can see this uh, flow here where lava flows down the side of the mountain. But in recent years, this uh, cone, the top of the volcano, has collapsed. And it turns out that... Um, in the recent past, it filled with water here, like a lake filled the bottom of this uh, depression. And that's an, an indication that there's water that leaks into the top of the, of the volcano, but it's also uh, creates a significant threat because if that water then dumps down into the lava, there's, there's a magma not far underneath the cone of the volcano. If water dumps down into there, and flash boils, it can create a steam explosion, which is incredibly dangerous. So it turns out that the eruption that took place last night actually took place uh, in the cone of Kilauea. And in fact, actually here you can see the water. Yeah. Actually, this satellite image is new enough. You can actually see the water. It's this kind of like uh, reddish, greenish kind of color. It's kind of brown. Uh, that's the water that was in there. It's not in there anymore. Uh, but the eruption took place last night. All of that uh, water turned into steam and it's gone. 
and uh, the eruption was fairly exciting. Now, it's not just that the lava only comes out here. Instead, this whole part of the island has uh, magma underneath it because the actual place where the magma chamber is located is right about here. It just turns out this is a vent where the lava came out in the most recent past. But there have been some other eruptions all along this eastern side. Um, a couple years ago, there was a very destructive uh, flow up here where it says Lalani Estates. And it turns out that the uh, age of these images differs depending upon when you zoom in. But here, as I zoom in, you'll see that there's this whole community where there are these roads that are nice and parallel forming this grid pattern. And uh, this whole part up here is not inhabited right now. It used to be, there were houses there, but this volcanic vent right here let lava out, the lava flowed downhill, and all these homes are now gone. They're just absolutely not there. In fact, these places where the streets used to be are now all uh, just lava on the surface. And in fact, I looked earlier, if you go to the street view and I drop the person here, it looks like in the satellite image, which is newer, that there's lava. But when I go to street view, it'll drop me down to what the street view looked like in 2011 because uh, it says down here, image capture 2011. These homes are no longer here. None of this is here anymore. Uh, this has all been overcovered with lava, like uh, 20 feet high. The, this stuff is just gone. It's just absolutely gone. All of it is not there. And it's that this place over here in the eastern part of the island is connected. Uh, this whole eastern part of the island has lava underneath it, magma underneath it, and it can flow out anywhere at any time. Here's a place in the recent past where it flowed out. Um, so people take a big risk owning homes. It's a beautiful land and it's a wonderful place to live, but uh, you take a big risk because the lava could just come and uh, take your house away and it's all gone. I've been here and it's pretty remarkable. There's roads that are cut and you can drive down around these roads and look to see where the lava is. Uh, this is the National Park Visitor Center, but they're in a bit of a state of emergency right now. So I'm going to play this video. It's relatively short. Um, and they talk about the eruption. This is, this was just published online. Let's see if I can get this uh, sound to work well. Kilauea is erupting once again. The summit eruption started suddenly at approximately 9.30 p.m. on Sunday evening during a brief earthquake swarm that shook the south side of the caldera. Multiple fissures opened on the walls of the crater and lava cascaded into the summit water lake, boiling it away. A new lava lake then began forming at the base of the crater. Accordingly, the USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory elevated the volcano alert level to a warning and its aviation color code to red. A short time after the eruption began, a larger earthquake, Measuring at a magnitude 4.4 shook the south flank of the volcano and was felt across the Big Island. The Hawaii County Civil Defense issued this radio message. This is a civil defense message. This is a local earthquake message for Sunday, December 20th. The Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reports an eruption at the Halima'uma'u crater of the Kilauea volcano. Trade winds will push any embedded ash toward the southwest. Fallout is likely in the Kau district in Wood Valley, Pahala, Nalehu, and Ocean View. Stay indoors to avoid ash exposure. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center reports that the earthquake, which occurred at approximately 1036 p.m. in the vicinity of south flank of Kilauea, was not large enough to cause a tsunami for Hawaii Island. I say again, there is no tsunami threat to the island of Hawaii. Photos and webcam images showed a towering cloud lifting over the area of the new eruption. The cloud even appeared to be visible from the telescopes on Mauna Kea, where south-facing webcams captured a view of the summit glow. At 12.21 a.m., the National Weather Service posted a message saying that all available data indicate that the eruption was easing with just a low-level steam cloud lingering. Civil Defense told them that no ashfall was observed near and downwind of the crater, including on Highway 11. They said the eruption may have been primarily comprised of steam. By early Monday morning, scientists were already posting videos of the new activity. 
One of the fountains within the crater was reported to measure 165 feet tall. HBO quickly published this map, which was constructed from aerial photos in September, but marked up to show the locations of the new activity. Red spots are the approximate locations of fissure vents feeding lava flowing into the bottom of the volcano crater. The scientists noted occasional blasts of uncertain origin are occurring from the new lava lake surface. This is the first eruption at Kilauea in over two years. Things have been mostly quiet ever since the destructive events on the Lower East Rift Zone in the summer of 2018. In recent weeks, however, scientists have been recording ground deformation and earthquake rates at the volcano's summit and Upper East Rift Zone that have exceeded background levels observed since the last eruption. The situation is rapidly evolving and HVO says it will issue another statement when more information is available. So that's a uh, pretty exciting news event. Uh, so I have links to uh, both the uh, story about the eruption and that update video. And then there's another one here, which is like an interview from the news that was like seven minutes long or so that uh, was just published. So it happened at like 9.30 at night in Hawaii, but we're like six or seven hours ahead. I forget, I think six hours ahead. I don't remember if they do daylight saving or not. But anyway, we're ahead of them by quite a, while, quite a ways, quite a few hours. Uh, so it was only known very early this morning for us here. Anyway, so that's exciting. They mentioned about tsunami because there's a possibility of having a tsunami uh, with an earthquake, but that earthquake was not as a result of a landslide or a seamount slide in the ocean, the uh, earthquake that people would have felt there on the Big Island was as a result of the volcanic of the uh, volcanic eruption itself. Because when the magma chamber blows open, the lava comes out, the earth settles down, and it causes an earthquake. Uh, but that's all exciting. All that lava ends up going to the sea, and it makes the island bigger all the time. Okay, other things uh, that I wrote about here. So in the plan for the week, twelve twenty one, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about non-native and invasive species. Um, there are species of animals and plants that live all over the world, and some of them live only in particular places. Humans have moved animals and plants around the earth, and sometimes we do it for uh, good reason, and other times it's done for bad reasons. Well, accidentally, sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally for bad reasons, or has bad effects. Um, hold on. Okay, so for instance, honeybees in North America are not native to this continent. Uh, Non-native honeybees were brought here from Europe in order to pollinate uh, not only plants that live in North America, but also non-native plants in North America that they're grown as crops for... Sorry about that. Fix the speaker a little bit, or the microphone. Uh, non-native plants, some or native and non-native plants have to be pollinated sometimes by uh, honeybees. So there are actually 23 different species of European honeybees that have been brought here. And then in your textbook on page 277, there's a description about how there's a type of sea star, uh, Asian Amur sea stars, that have begun to show up in the waters off of North America since 2011. And the hypothesis is that they were brought over um, on debris from the 2011 Japan tsunami. In other words, the tsunami that took place in 2011 disrupted a whole bunch of like boats and floating things in uh, Japan, and it turns out that the sea stars get mixed up with this debris. They can be carried across the ocean and then dumped off in the uh, in North America. So there are natural ways in which animals and plants get moved around the earth. Um, and then there are non-natural ways like humans. There's a big problem in Florida with uh, invasive Burmese pythons and green iguanas. They are uh, not native to Florida, and the Everglades are full of Burmese pythons, the Florida Keys are full of green iguanas. They're reptiles that don't belong in uh, Florida, and they're really damaging. They eat bird eggs, they'll eat small mammals. There's also invasive species like kudzu. I put a link here about kudzu. Kudzu is a type of vine that's particularly destructive uh, in North America. It's native to Japan, China, and uh, India and it grows as a vine and then sometimes it ends up covering trees entirely and it'll um, just end up killing native species. It's not 
very good to eat for most animals and it's uh it's highly destructive in in nature animals and plants are kept in check in the food web whenever they have natural predators but if there are no natural predators and if things actually grow better in other places then you end up with uh them overtaking other species in pennsylvania we have this acute problem with a uh, an insect called the spotted spotted uh, lanternfly. Spotted lanternflies were first uh, discovered in 2014, and they're now all over the state. Uh, spotted uh, lanternflies. Let me see. There's a picture of one here. I'll get a picture of one. Spotted lanternflies are now all over the state. They eat, or they uh, they look pretty. They look like a beautiful little moth. But anyway, they, uh, they eat uh, sap from trees and um, they can outcompete other insects. And uh, they're a non-native invasive species. So when things are non-native but not damaging, they're not necessarily called invasive. But if they are damaging, then you end up with an invasive species. In water in North America, there's a type of mussel called the zebra mussel. Zebra mussels are now all over the place in the Great Lakes. Zebra mussels are little uh, bivalves. And it turns out that they've showed up in the 1980s and uh, they're filter feeders. So what they do is they filter um, nutrients from the water, from the body of water itself. Well, let me reload this here. So it turns out that they sort of clean water except the problem is if water is very, very clean, it can be difficult for um, small, I don't know why this isn't loading, for small uh, larva of fish to find enough food. And very crystal clear water makes it easier for uh, birds of prey and other fish to eat little, uh, little um, you know, hatchlings and stuff. So I don't know why this wasn't loading on this site. It should just be loading. But anyway, you can read about zebra mussels. And then there's another problem with uh, other types of fish throughout North America. There's particularly a kind of fish called a snakehead fish, which has become very invasive. Uh, snakeheads can tolerate all kinds of different water and they outcompete other fish. They're not native to North America. Um, and there's a couple different species of them. So there's a description about snakehead fish. So invasive species can affect both uh, things on land, things in the water. They can be fish, they can be plants, they can be, you know, reptiles, bivalves, all kinds of different stuff. So this project is about invasive lionfish. So uh, lionfish are native to, um, this is the article that I want you to read. It's linked here, the lionfish in the Atlantic and Caribbean article. It's also straight up in the folder for this week. Um, this is an article that is published by MASNA, M-A-S-N-A. -S That's the Marine Aquarium Societies of North America. And uh, we, there's an educational series that's published by MASNA describing uh, things that aquarium keepers should do and should not do. And it says uh, by the MASNA board and volunteers, it turns out I'm a co-author of this. There were four of us who wrote it. And it's an article that describes what lionfish are and why they're in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. They're beautiful fish with these long spines and long fins. The ends of the spines are venomous. So the fish has an enormous amount of protection from uh, other fish. And uh, it turns out that they, f they are native to, they're two major species. There's one species that's native to the Indian Ocean and another species in this green area that's native to the Pacific Ocean, the Indo-Pacific Ocean, um, throughout Indonesia, Eastern Australia, and going into the Southern Pacific. The place where they're non-native is in the Atlantic Ocean. So everywhere here in red is areas where these lionfish have now shown up where they're not native to. And as a result, they cause a, a huge amount of damage. There's a pretty good description in this article about um, where they came from, what their life cycle is like, 
why they're destructive, and it has some numbers about the cumulative research that's been done about them. Let me show you a, a quick video that gives you a, a little bit of an overview. Oh, I guess I can show you this first. This is a, in the article, there's a link to a site that's no longer active showing the uh, distribution of the lionfish. So around 1987, they were first sighted in the waters off of Miami. And then these red dots by year show sighting locations throughout the Atlantic and the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. And you see now as we go forward up through 2018, this actually stops 2018, but it's about the same in 2020. The lionfish have really taken over huge amounts of areas. Um, they get carried up the East Coast primarily by the Gulf Stream. So we studied the Gulf Stream. And then there's also a current that exists in the Gulf of Mexico. And that current in the Gulf of Mexico helped distribute them in the Gulf of Mexico. But they're also very good at moving along in coastal areas, especially where the water's shallow. And this is Bermuda out here. So they're also sighted in Bermuda. Their population has exploded. Uh, the last time I dove in uh, Florida, it was actually quite a while ago now, probably 2003. And I didn't see any. I've never seen one in the, in the ocean, uh, 2003. And then I was in the Virgin Islands in 2004 and didn't see any but they also hadn't been sighted there by 2004. But now you can almost be guaranteed that diving on the reefs in uh, the Keys and in uh, the Virgin Islands, you see them regularly and all the time. So here's a real quick uh, introduction video about invasive lionfish. This is like two minutes long. It's likely that the invasion started sometime in the mid-1980s. That's when the first reported sighting was of lionfish just north of Miami. You have an animal that once it invades um, can really increase in population numbers very rapidly. Well, lionfish really are sort of the perfect storm. Uh, I think in many ways, as invasive species goes, they have a lot of characteristics which make them very successful in, in the invaded range. They reproduce very early in life, so they reach maturity, they grow very rapidly. They're capable of dispersing uh, large distances during their egg and larval phase, which ride ocean currents. A species that has venomous spines, they don't seem to have many native predators or predators in their invaded range here, so it's possible that because they're so armored with the venomous spines that that they don't have a lot of natural predators, which would lead them to basically not worry about. In general, one of the major impacts that we're going to find from this is, is essentially the fact that they're eating a whole variety of, of our native species. For one, they're removing prey that would have been available for many of our native fish stocks, like snapper and grouper that are feeding on similar uh, small-bodied reef fishes. They're also certainly having a direct predatory impact on many of those small reef fishes. And while we don't fish for those species, those species perform important ecological services on the reef. Very little is known about lionfish biology and ecology. Our research program on lionfish here in northeastern Florida is trying to characterize a lot of the life history traits of lionfish. So we're looking at things like how fast do they grow? Uh, how many times do they reproduce? How many eggs do they produce? Most of the fish that we get for our work is actually through collaborations with local fishermen. Many of those folks are very interested, obviously, in what's going on with their ecosystem and supports their livelihood. And so they're very eager to help for our part. We get to get samples from a huge geographic area that would cost us thousands of dollars to run our own research program. I think the best chance we have um, to, to mitigate some of the impacts of lionfish is to encourage uh, fishery removals, whether that's through recreational spear fishermen or whether that's through the development of a commercial uh, lionfish fishery, whether that be through traps or spear fishing or any of these other gear types, but uh, just get a larger fraction of these fish out of the water. 
I think right now the best strategy we have for controlling the fish is human consumption. If we can increase the amount harvested uh, through a variety of ways, uh, increase demand for this species in both seafood markets, increase demand in terms of restaurants to get restaurants to carry it. At this point, no one's talking about eradication. Of course. But again, if you can have enough effort and mitigate, uh, it should have been shown at relatively small scales that uh, can dent the population. Okay, so um, that was like a brief overview. There's a bunch of different videos you can see about uh, that kind of work. What you were looking at there uh, in much of that video is removal of the lionfish from the, uh, from the ocean. There's an organization in Florida called REEF. It's the REEF Environmental Education Foundation. And their major job is lionfish removal. And they do lionfish derbies where, um, you know, they do education about lionfish and removing the lionfish from the uh, ocean. And it turns out that you can fish for lionfish. Uh, you don't need a permit or a license. You can take as many as you want because they're invasive. And it turns out they're good eating. They're, they're delicious. It's a very, very good buttery fish. It's delicious. Um, it's among the best. But the problem is it's hard to fish for them. You have to dive and you have to take them out. Um, you can't catch them with a net. You can't catch them on a line. And in the article, there's a description about why you can't catch them that way, but it might even be obvious. Okay. So here's the thing about how they eat. It's very unique and uh, peculiar. We used to have we used to keep lionfish here at school from time to time. We just don't have any now. It turns out they're very susceptible to a disease that they end up with um, in their jaw whenever they're in captivity because they just don't eat uh, too regularly. Their fins serve a couple different purposes. They'll hunt in packs and they use those fins to kind of like corral fish. And uh, as they kind of corral them, the small fish get confused and they'll chase them around uh, but oftentimes they'll eat by stalking. So you'll see here that they'll kind of lay low and wait for the small fish to get near them. In the Atlantic and the Caribbean, many of those fish species uh, don't recognize the lionfish as predators. So they just end up just getting eaten very easily and very quickly. Um, they have a particular feeding method. And I think the video might be a little bit choppy for you. So I put a link in the uh, video description, I'll show you where that is, where you can watch this in slow motion. But let me go uh, and slow this down here, playback speed a quarter. They do a type of eating uh, that's called gulp eating. So here you'll see the lionfish uh, come near its prey. There we go, that's just about right. So if I back up just a tad bit, you'll see that its mouth is in its normal position. And then what it does is it extends its mouth forward, like extends its lips forward uh, a couple inches. And then at the same time, then opens its gill plates. And when it opens the gill plates, it creates like a suction straight in so that if there's any fish that's within some position in front of the lionfish itself, the fish ends up getting sucked right in. So here if I play, you see the fish goes right on in. And uh, they don't even chew them, they just swallow them whole. It's a pretty remarkable feeding action. And so basically like if you happen to be about a couple inches in front of one of these lionfish's mouth, uh, you go in and that's it. And so the lionfish will stay nice and low in the reef and just consume uh, huge amounts of food. They eat voraciously and they grow very quickly. And like in the video, they say they reach reproductive age in a very short period of time, meaning they, uh, they're, they're able to start producing eggs and have babies. And they have mil they have, uh, an individual female lionfish can have millions of babies in the course of its life. So the growth of the species invasiveness has been remarkable. Here's another slow-mo video. It's almost like surreal. They have sets of uh, teeth in their jaw, a pharyngeal jaw in the back of their mouth that uh, ends up taking them in. 
Okay, so there's a couple mitigation efforts. Um, another link that I put in the plan for today, there's a TEDx talk uh, by Aaron Spencer. Uh, Aaron is a friend of mine who works, who used to work for Reef, and she's in the National Geographic Young Explorers Program. And uh, this TED talk's about 13 minutes, but she goes into very good detail about uh, the work that she's done in documenting and educating people about uh, invasive lionfish, especially with tourists in Florida. Um, the National Geogra Geographic Young Explorers Program is a remarkable program. She's now working on a PhD um, related to invasive species. There's other mitigation techniques. It turns out, I put four links to some videos here. that say natural elimination by teaching species to eat lionfish. So in the, in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, there are fish that will eat fish and sharks and eels and stuff that will eat lionfish. But in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, there aren't um, any predators for these lionfish. There's no natural way to control them. But scientists have worked hard to train different kinds of animals to be able to eat lionfish. And oftentimes that has to do with um, presenting the lionfish to the food creating a feeding response that's natural to it. So here's a case where um, a scientist is trying to train barracuda to eat lionfish. And despite the fact that they have these venomous spines, some animals don't seem to really mind too much. Barracuda will only eat, um, they, they like to go after fish that are up in the water column and not fish that are hanging out on the bottom. So it's not natural for barracuda to eat fish that are sitting on the bottom. But here it's like they're like training the uh, barracuda to eat a lionfish. And you can see that it's natural feeding response to look for fish that are in trouble or in turmoil. And by shaking the lionfish up in the water column, that is a natural feeding response for the barracuda. And uh, then the barracuda can then end up recognizing the lionfish as food. And it's not as if one barracuda could do all the work, but you know that animals will end up uh, passing those traits through teaching or through um, like evolutionary pass down to their young. So if you can end up training different kinds of fish in different areas to eat the, uh, the uh, lionfish, then you can end up having a natural way to get rid of them. So they've done work with training eels, sharks, groupers, and barracuda off the coast of Florida to naturally remove the lionfish. So between fishing for them and having uh, natural um, methods by having other animals remove them, you can end up getting rid of them. Well, maybe not totally getting rid of them, but at least reducing their populations dramatically. So anyway, um, it's not as if you have to watch all these videos or read all the things. What's most important is to read this lionfish in the Atlantic and Caribbean article. And that goes along with the assignment. So. You got a little bit of time now, but um, tomorrow I'm not going to talk too much. Just maybe just like an update about the volcano. Uh, but you still have to check in for class tomorrow. But uh, and I'll answer questions about the lionfish in the Atlantic and Caribbean. But basically, like when you click that, uh, hold on, I don't know why it's not showing up. Let's see, edit. Maybe it's not linked correctly. Oh yeah, it's not linked correctly. All right, sorry about that. It wasn't even linked. I'm glad I just checked it. Okay, oceanography. Eight to 10, lionfish in the Caribbean. Here we go, attach. Okay, now it's there. Um, okay, so anyway, when you click on that, I just have some things that I want you to reflect on from what you see in the videos and from what you read in the article, especially what you read in the article. The article is only a couple pages. So what's an invasive species? How does it damage an ecosystem? What parts of the world's ocean are lionfish native to? Um, let's see, there's some more stuff. Eventually it'll load. I don't know, our network's been a little bit slow today. How did the lionfish end up in the Atlantic and the Caribbean? That's a very important thing to read about in the Masna article. Um, they don't just show up there accidentally. There is a reason why they ended up there. And you'll see that in some of the videos, but especially in the lionfish in the Caribbean, 
um, article, there's a good description about how they ended up there. What are some ways we're trying to remove the lionfish and why is it difficult to remove them with regular fishing techniques like line fishing, you know, like with a rod and reel or with a, a net. So think about what it takes for fish to, well, not want to be caught, but be tricked into being caught. All right, so really that's about it. Um, you got just a few minutes to work on that or you got some time a little bit later today. Um, and then you'll have time tomorrow to work on the lionfish in the Caribbean. You should be able to get that done by the end of the day tomorrow. And that's gonna be it for, uh, for before break. So if you have questions or thoughts, you can put them in the chat, turn on your mic, whatever you wanna do. Otherwise, uh, that's it for today. And I'll catch you back here tomorrow.